Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Paul Brown Show. This evening, I have with my guests, I have Miss Leslie Dwyer and Mr. Marlon Patton. How y'all doing this evening? I'm great, thank you. Doing Perfect. well, Mr. Brown. Thank right, you so much right. for having us. Tell the audience a little bit about yourselves. First, we'll start with Miss Leslie. Hi there. Um, yeah, I was in stadium finance, so I was recruited to Charlotte 23 years ago. Um, and by the bank, I'm one of those uh, stories that you hear about all the time in Charlotte. The standard came here for the bank, stayed because I love Charlotte. And um, I now I'm trying to uh, create a framework and an entity like what we have for tourism and on behalf of a stadium, but instead create that for our historically and predominantly black communities so that they have that same voice. Okay, great. And Mr. Marlin, tell us about yourself. Yes, um, so I'm a rising senior at the University of Chicago. Okay. Um, but for, first and foremost, I'm a native Charlottean, and I'm a fifth-generation resident of the historic Cherry neighborhood um, located um, in the heart of Charlotte, North Carolina. Ray, so what's, glad to be here. What's your major? I'm double majoring in political science and economics, and I'm minoring in human rights. Great, great. Okay, the topic we have today is Saving Cherry Morgan School. Tell the audience why we selected that topic. Well, it's well, so, so, well if, if, if I may, you know, briefly answer the question, because it's the fight at hand right now. And um, if you aren't fighting, you're sitting on the sidelines. This Morgan School has been in the community for years upon years. Um, the, the John and Mary Myers, who created, you know, Cherry, platted it in 1891 as the first um, African-American community specifically for laborers and families to own homes in the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Just w think about it in 1891, look at how the significance of that um, black folk owning homes instead of renting or leasing them. Um, John and Mary Myers donated the land for Myers Park in 1917. Construction was completed in um, 1925 for the Morgan School. And in 1926, the school opened and has remained at capacity until until its closing. So it has an illustrious history in Cherry, and we're fighting for it to stay in Cherry as a 21st century community learning and resource center. Leslie? Um, I was lucky enough to have a friend tell me uh, what was going on with Cherry because it's the perfect example of creating a public-private uh, partnership, but not one for profiting a corporation, which is Charlotte's history and tradition and uh, here in Charlotte, but instead bringing a community together to own their, their, pro their shared property. Um, uh, Fifty years ago, when we were, st we were doing things like urban renewal and what happened in the Brooklyn neighborhood, and this was happening all over the country, the idea was the only way to manage land like that was for it to be managed um, and owned by a city or a private entity, not the community itself. And since then, an economist, and this is uh, my love of Milan as well, his study of economics, <laughs> and since then, uh, an economist was able to prove that the best way to use land over the long run is for the community o to own it, because they will do what's best for their neighbors. And that's the key to Morgan School, is getting it in the hands of neighbors. Well, what seems to be going on right now? I mean, what, uh, what's, what's, the, what's bringing about, what's the issues that we're having right now? Yes, so to provide a bit of context, um, it's been documented in Charlotte publication that the Cherry community has been fighting for to use the school as a community center, community learning and resource center, for going on 40 years. And for 40 years, Cherry has been shut out. Um, promises have been made, promises have been delayed, and promises have been denied. Um, the school, since its closing, has been used as a teenage parents learning center, has been used as a K-9 education center, has been used as a community charter school, um, and to knowledge of members of the community, um, lease or purchase, lease purchase or sale um, of the building was put on moratorium um, for a while. We come to find out at the beginning of January that they had entered into, they as in CMS, who owns the building, has entered into a nine-year, 11-month lease agreement 
with Arts Plus, an entity with no history in Cherry, with no established work in Cherry, and, 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 and whose interest and whose mission does not align with the needs of the Cherry community to its fullest. Um, not to mention the fact that for 40 years we've been fighting for this. Um, and now this is Arts Plus coming in recently, being able to jump us in line um, for a building that has historical significance to us. So as, as, as you, you might assume, we fight that. Um, and we fight that with all our heart, with all our soul, so that we can get that building. And um, in the face of CMS pressure, county pressure, whatnot, um, we're determined to get the building. So that is the fight, um, the fight to um, keep an organization from jumping us in line um, and, and a fight to keep this building in, in cherry. Um, if I may, this is where I'm so concerned about the structural issue here in Charlotte, and that is the standing relationship with what Charlotte calls its economic partners. And that's an entity like the Arts and Sciences Council, uh, which, well, up until this last year with their, with their drama, but an entity like Arts Plus is heavily funded and has, uh, by an organization that has a permanent partnership with, with the city and with economic development, just like tourism does or Center City Partners does. And so that's how they jump the line, is that they already had this re relationship with the county manager and uh, therefore with CMS's real estate folks. And as they are losing um, um, their Spirit Square in Uptown, they were looking for a place to go. And, and sh CMS is just treating it like real estate grab and a lease opportunity rather than this is history. And we put, if we really care, as they've been saying about critical race theory and systemic racism, if we really care about that, we should be doing what's best for existing black community. It's their history. It's not our history to tell. But instead, they go with these relationships. So now Cherry's playing defense. We need a structure that will be s a standing structure to represent our historically black neighborhoods that's there permanently to say, okay, we're here for the same thing. We want what they're getting, and you can't forget us. You can't brush us aside. And, and that's what we need in place. I think that I have a lot of friends and neighbors that I've spoken to about this, and once they hear that the question in front of CMS right now is, do we put the building in the hands of a white, heavily funded, nonprofit focused on just arts, or do we let the neighborhood deal with it? And my neighbors know exactly how we'd feel if it was our neighborhood, and also know that this is just dead wrong, and that when we have contributed to arts foundations and that sort of thing over the years, this is the last thing that we want. It's about those trade-offs. And there's no permanent place for people like me to say, oh, no, 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 put the black community first. And, and, and Mr. Brown, if I may add on to that, when Ms. Leslie talks about equity, it's just that. You cut on the news, you cut on the local news, you open up the paper, um, and you listen or you read long enough, you're going to see something in the news um, regarding the government, regarding equity. Um, this is not equity in theory. This is equity in practice. This is an organization who for 40 years, um, a community, an entity um, in solidarity who has for 40 years fought for this building. And now we're allowing someone with more funding, more access, more power, um, and the influence in both the city, the county, as well as CMS um, to come in and supplant this. This is equity. Well, fast, I, I, I want to backtrack a bit to when busing started to occur and Morgan School closed. Um, students as young as five and six had to be bused to um, Eastover Elementary, Myers Park Elementary, and um, the third school is Elizabeth Elementary. So they had to be bused from Cherry without a bus. CMS did not supply a bus for students in Cherry as low as five and six to go to elementary school after Morgan School closed. Did not supply a bus. But the parents of Cherry loved the education. They started off carpooling those who had cars, two and three, four kids, to the schools throughout the day, picking them up. They started off doing that because CMS would not supply that in the same way they did others. You know, buses had been, been around for a while. It got to the point 
where parents and families got together in Cherry and bought a bus called the Blue Goose. If you want to look it up, if you have an Ancestry.com membership, go to the newspaper section and do that. Bought the Blue Goose. It was a bus they had parents on shifts. This day, one parent will go around, the, uh, do the rounds, times just like a regular CMS bus um, that you see the yellow buses nowadays. Fully funded by Cherry. Fully for the kids of Cherry when there was nothing else to supply Cherry. Five and six years old, CMS and other entities thought that it would be good for them to walk as much as two miles going over to places like Myers Park, just going down um, and then coming back in inclement weather and whatnot in a time such as that, segregation, um, um, strong racism, strong bigotry. And look at the perseverance of Cherry. Um, this, is the same, this is the same fight. This is nothing different in terms of equity and opportunity. So what have the people that's in the community, what types of, you know, have they been getting involvement trying to get this, you know, situation? What type of actions have they been doing? Well, I, I think it's important to note that first, Cherry runs far and wide. Um, I'm a fifth generation resident of Cherry. Ms. Leslie's not a resident of Cherry, but she's a very, very helpful ally. She's been present. Others have been present. We, we've been able to create this community. We had last month, we had a Black Food Truck Fridays event in support of Cherry. We had a fight, we had a um, festival, um, Fight for Morgan Festival, we called it. We had a beautification of the Morgan School building. We had a Black Food Truck event with vendors um, with the amazing support of Black Food Truck Fridays um, that attracted almost 2,000 people. Um, and again, we've been fighting for the building for 40 years. Um, we've created this support around this initiative to use it in the community, whether it's arts, um, because we're not against the arts, but arts is not the only thing we need. Um, se se senior, senior development, senior uh, tutoring um, in, in the technology space, youth tutoring in the, in, in the space, um, workforce education. So all these things, we have developed this plan, and we have also, importantly, gained financial backing. So when we found out, out about this in January, in just in less than six months, in closer to four, five months, we secured, we got financial backing. Um, and that's important because the whole narrative is um, we, we, we're not equipped, we're not ready. Um, and it's the same thing you hear about communities when people try and come in and set the narrative for communities. We've secured this financial backing. Keep in mind, Arts Plus has been around for a while. Um, and, and, and this is not a fight against Arts Plus specifically but they have had that access. They have funding directly from the city, um, from ASC, from other entities, um, and they have the um, history of looking for these schools and other, and other buildings to call their home. We did it in, in less than six months. So let no one tell you that Cherry, let no one tell you that communities do not have the power, the resources, and the foresight, and the wisdom, and the knowledge to create their own narrative, to organize, to galvanize, to get these things done. But we're still fighting for it to do the table. I know with the growing of Charlotte, I know this is happening in Cherry, but it's also happening in other communities. So what? this is kind of like something that everybody should kind of like look at when you see this happening in Cherry, is happening in other neighborhoods as well. So and it's happening nationally. Correct. So when I look at this, um, uh, Mylon talks about equity, and that is very true. I'm looking at this as a public finance banker, and I've known from 25 years ago, the key is you don't keep investing in what is financially the top of the ladder you invest financially in the bottom of the ladder, and you do it with nonprofit foundation money. It's, it's a matter of making sure that that's available. What, uh, there was data that came out of Harvard, I, a whole lot of people have heard about, which said Charlotte is the place where it's hardest to get out, uh, to move up. If you are born into the bottom 25%, it's almost impossible to grow up. We had the highest growth of the 50 largest cities in the country and the lowest level of upward mobility. And Charlotte's task force came together and said, you know, and those are Charlotte leaders, and meaning they brought to the table wealthy people. 
And those folks said, oh my goodness, why aren't they moving up? So from the big picture, which is, that's where my expertise comes in, um, it, lo- it said the ladder got steeper for everyone. The thing that they were excited about is they were able to all of a sudden map the census tract, and yes, it t- showed explicitly that previously redlined neighborhoods are where this was happening. Previously redlined neighborhoods are where the investment wasn't happening because everyone's expecting investment to come from the outside instead of foundations investing in the folks that are already there. And so what's what happened is they laid out the argument for semi- st- systemic racism, and they're not wrong. But the one thing that talked about the economic development of this, the people at the table were the entities like Tourism Center City Partners and those folks and city and county staff that wants to do economic development, and they said, oh, my goodness, do more. And when they did that, they, they said things like opportunity zones, and the opportunity zones map where, um, yes, here's where those, those neighborhoods, and exactly the data showed African-American, native-born Charlottean did not move up. The people who won were the people that looked like me, white, co- white college-educated tra- transplant. And here's the key to this. When you hear your elected officials say, hey, if we do this deal, if we buy Tepper a, a new stadium, if we give $50 million to Honeywell, if we do those things, it will bring jobs, investment, and taxes I helped create that analysis 25 years ago, and they're using that as the excuse. Okay, sure it does. And also, it says there will be winners and losers, that some people will really win and some people will not benefit from that. And what we know explicitly now that we did not predict with that is that specifically those black neighborhoods would lose. And it's not that they failed to move up, which is how the task force and leaders in Charlotte are looking at it as why did they fail to move up. It's that lost, not failed, lost. The system failed. The system itself is putting money there. So this is happening all over the city. In fact, we, I, you and I were talking about it on the way in, that the, the, the same thing is happening in the neighborhood we're in right now with people being brushed aside who are homeowners who don't want to sell because they're being sold for development. Every time we put weight around the argument of housing, it strengthens this argument that we need to get to developers who are going to do multifamily housing. And, okay, they'll put a little bit of... Um, of affordable housing in it. But, but in many cases, we're not talking about the fact that small houses, people that already live there, legacy neighbors, people who have built lives there are the ones that are being lowballed on their houses and sh- brushed, brushed, aside, uh, brushed, excuse me, brushed aside. It's happening all over Charlotte. And we need... and. The leaders in the task force and all those folks are saying, hey, we've got the solution. We'll fix things. Okay, I got a question as far as you're saying that they will never grow as far as if they've been born or whatever in a certain, Mm -hmm. they'll never move up to another ladder. I think for me, I think that's a mental thing because if someone's telling me that I'll never move up and if I continue to hear it, then I will never move up because I believe mentally that I can't move up. Right. But that's because opportunities are there. Well, and, and what they ignored when they said that is they're looking at the back, back they were looking at the bottom, I'm using air quotes here, the bottom 20% of a range of wages. Okay, if you have a range of numbers, there will always be a bottom 20%. What they ignored 
is that those numbers are have a boat anchor on them. What they ignored is the fact that of the role of a living wage and unions and and exactly what you just said. As that task force and the legacy of it, it's called Leading on Opportunity, and it's considered the foundation of both the city and county budgets. As that strategy is in place, I a lot of them don't grasp that they're doing exactly what you said. It creates racism. It creates implicit bias. So for someone like me and my neighbors who are going from from a place of of gratitude and saying, I didn't want these neighborhoods to be left aside. I bought the idea of the New South. I did not want us to be the fifth most segregated city in the country. But as they go scramble and go, okay, what's wrong? They're missing the fact that they're not the solution. Folks can move up, and by constantly sending that message and drilling into the data, but the people with the data at Harvard were really excited that all of a sudden they had more data to play with, and that's what they've started to do. And that's why they're giving that message. And that's, it's so hard to watch. From my lens, I, I, I'm telling people this over and over and over, the people that have been colleagues in the past that don't grasp, that's what they're telling folks. If we have a platform I'm talking about where neighbors run it, all of a sudden you're saying, Milan's neighbors are saying, here's what's working. Here's what got families forward. Who, here's who graduated college from University of Chicago with a degree in economics mm. and political science. Here's what works. Instead of, you're the problem. Right now we have something like the developers that, who are saying, hey, we're bringing investment and jobs and tax. They have been saying that for 30 years. So they're constantly saying they're the solution. We have to have a place where we show the wins. We're not giving hope right now. Now, Milo, now I know we talk about Cherry and what's going on, Cherry situation, but how have y'all gotten the politicians involved in getting this situation, you know, getting involved in this? Because this is very important. Yes, um, and and it's certainly been an uphill battle. I, th I think you see with 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 anybody with you know money, influence, power, trying to combat that is going to be an uphill battle. But we still have hope. Um, we we've, we've spoken at, in in length with the county commissioners. We have an amazing county commissioner that represents us, Commissioner Mark Jarrell, who has been at the forefront of trying to bring stakeholders to the table, trying to get the facts for us when facts were unclear. And, and trying to find a way forward that's that's best for the community. And we've also had other commissioners who have doubted um, explicitly and to the point where, where, where it, it, it really hit home with me as disrespectful, um, doubted the legitimacy of the community leaders in Cherry who have fought year after year after year when no one else would fight for them, going as far to say that they don't believe that Cherry is ready. Uh, my grandmother, as context, is the last um, surviving founding member of Cherry Community Organization, which is a community organization in Cherry. So, so, so that seems like a personal affront to her, as well as all the others, um, elders in the community who fought and fought and fought for legitimacy and power um, and, and, and solidarity in a place that was not that was not built for them and that was not made for them. So with that in mind, we've had good county commissioners, we've had um, not so good county commissioners, as well as politicians in general. And you can see that with elected officials, those who um, take the time to learn um, and to take the time to listen, um, do a great job. But those who don't, who come in and, and, and believe that they know what's best for communities, just like in my opinion, in my personal opinion, Arts Plus has. Um, when we started our conversation with them in late January, they said they wanted to be a good neighbor. We told them explicitly that we've been fighting for 40 years, and they have not moved from that position. It's going on six months, and, and this fight was never, you know, against them. It was against legitimacy in the eyes of the city and the county and CMS. But for them to not move from their position after six months, it shows that they're complicit in the act of inequity in the city of Charlotte. 
So, 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 so these, these sorts of conversations, they are not easy ones because we have people who love arts. We have people who may be on the other side of the political aisle, but this is about truth telling. Um, as Miss Leslie said, it's about the financial aspect of it. And as we have said for over 40 years, if we have said since 1891, when we were the first black homeowners neighborhood in the city of Charlotte, this is about equity and what is fair and what is just and what is based upon respect. Sir, if I may, um, Mylan's just talked about um, Commissioner Jarrell, who is, yes, an example of the good. As a white woman in a white neighborhood who's looking, has been following this now, I'm mortified at having watched the actual communications, uh, um, emails and whatnot, between um, specifically and especially between CMS, our um, CMS representative, and uh, Cherry in terms of the specific examples of disrespect we're talking about here. First and foremost, CCO, Cherry's organization, has actually owned property before and set up to preserve its history and, like he said, has generations of involvement. My neighborhood, Chantilly, has a neighborhood association that gets together and does a spring fling. Uh, we have never, and I assure you, could never own property well together. <laughs> um, it's a social organization. There are, I'm considered an old timer in the neighborhood with 23 years in. It's painful to use the word old timer. But there are maybe a half a dozen people that are either original homeowners. I do have a neighbor that was born there and and all, but we're people that have come in from the outside. Our county commi our excuse me, our our uh, school board uh, yeah, uh, thank member. you. Uh, our school board member has made a career of talking about equity in schools and and systemic racism and critical race theory. And yet I have watched these emails that are a direct pushback of questioning actually yes questioning the legitimacy i've had two school board members say to me that that i've known for years say to me well i don't even know anything about the organization okay you ought to be ashamed of that these are your constituents you ought to be ashamed of that and and an email that says okay we're going to, if before we consider working uh, with CCO, we're going to need to know things like their, uh, an application, an application process if they want to lease. I'm sure we did that with Arts Plus, and we'd need to see things like financial statements. So I did a Freedom of Information Act request with the county to see if, to, to, I wanted to see the application. No application. There are flat out. This isn't just, I, I, oh, well, he see, it, it seems like a slight. <laughs>